So thanks for having me. Um, if I'm not talking clearly, that's because my beard is too big, probably, and it disturbs the microphone. So I'm going to talk about a nail in the Java Key Store coffin. So those of you who are already afraid that I'm going to show Java code, don't worry. There is no Java code in my presentation. So uh, everyone should be fine. So um, about me and us, so I'm actually, my name is Tobias Osbold, and I'm working as a security analyst, as a pen tester at Mod Zero. Um, we're a small company, but hopefully a little bit known in Switzerland by now. We're doing it for quite a long time. Uh, we have a very specialized um, group of people working at Mod Zero. Um, I've been doing a lot of different research, so I love to use per proxy a write extension for it. Um, I'm also doing a lot of Android and AFL fuzzing and Java fuzzing, and my next talk is going, probably going to be about Java fuzzing, but this one is about a different topic. So, um, Motero, as I said, uh, we do security analysis. What's a little bit special is that we also do a lot of uh, hardware analysis, not only software. Um, the content I'm going to talk about today is the purpose of uh, and mechanics of key store files. So why do we use key store files at all? And just to say it already, so Java key store, that's actually a name for the API in Java. So we have different kind of key store types, but the entire API is called Java key store. But one of the types, the oldest type, is also called JKS, which is the acronym. So JKS is the file type, and Java key store is the entire API. And Java key store has more than just JKS. So we talk about key store types as well, and the purpose and the mechanics of Java key store, um, and especially that file type, JKS. Then we're going to look at the weaknesses and the cracking. So um, we're at the security conference here. I didn't only look at the file format. I also tried to break it. And at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about the recommendations and what you can do. So to start with, I hope um, you're a little bit familiar with uh, private keys and public keys and how asymmetric crypto works as a small refresher. Um, so there's a private key, so you generate keys for yourself, you have a private key and a public key. And the private key is called private because you want to keep it private and secret and not give it to anybody else. So not what Adobe did. So as you see here, um, in the middle of the picture, you see, you see begin PGP private key. So Adobe once did a mistake and published their PGP private key on their website. So this is not how it works. You don't want to publish your private keys. You want to keep them secret within your organization. So asymmetric crypto, as said, um, consists of a public key and a private key. And as a user, I want to store them somehow, right? But I want to store them um, securely. So I put them into a key store file, so that's just one file on our hard disk in the end, and put it on the hard disk. Now, to make it secure, I want to encrypt this data that is in that file, and I do that with a password. So I, I supply a password, it uses some encryption mechanism, and my private key and public keys are safe. So without knowing the password, you shouldn't be able to access those keys. Now, that's the use of you. Um, in Java, you have different options. As said before, we have JKS as a format, which is the oldest format, but we also have a, an entire list of uh, other formats you can use. Now, I'm going to talk about the first one today and the weaknesses of the oldest one, the JKS. Now, JKS is actually used nearly everywhere where asymmetric crypto is used. So it's a default format in Java before version 10. And um, it's also in all Android versions, so it's used a lot. So just to tell you where it's used, for example, and this is just a very small list of examples, Oracle databases store their TLS keys in JKS files, Apache Tomcat as well. And when you do a new Android app, you also have to, to uh, sign your app 
and that you do with the key. So whenever you have to publish a new Android app, a JKS file will be created for you. So basically, wherever there is public key cryptography and Java, you will find these JKS files. Now, let's look at an example, Android Studio. So it allows us to use a UI to generate these JKS files. The first thing it will ask is the key store path. So where on your hard disk will you store this file? So super simple and easy. Then there's the key store password, which is the password, as we said before. Then we have a key alias, so we can give our key a name, fine with me. And then there's also the key password. Now, now we should be a little bit confused, right? I mean, why are there two different passwords? There's the key store password, and then there's also a key password. So now we have this situation. Now, let's take a small shortcut, and I will tell you um, what this is about. So actually, this is what's the first design mistake they did. The key store password is not used for encryption. It's only used for integrity checks. So this password is incorporated into a checksum, to check if somebody modified the key store file. But it doesn't mean it, it will protect your private key or your public key. So nobody tells you that the first password is super unimportant and the second one is super important, right? So here, here we are. We just get this UI and nobody tells me what to do, which password to, to, to choose securely and which one is not of importance. Now, this is actually the first really strange design decision, right? Now, okay, let's go back. Let's forget about this key store password then. It's not used for encryption. So we have a key password. But then, well, when I looked at this, there's another second thing that they did design really um, not according to best practices, I would say. What they did is only encrypt the private key. So the public key is actually stored in plain text. So it depends on what you do with these um, keys, but in general, I would, as a user, I would like to encrypt both of them because why should anybody be able to extract a public key um, from my key store file? But well, okay, let's rename this key password to private key password because it doesn't protect the public key, right? So. Now we have this private key password used for encryption and we have an encrypted private key. So far, so good. But this is a really strange design decision again. Now, you will probably already know what's coming now. We want to know what the black box is in the middle because somehow the Java developers designed something here and it, all, it is already a little bit fishy. So let's look look at it in detail. So the encryption of the private key is actually pretty simple. Um, it's, a, it's a private key in clear text that is XOR with something called Keystream, and then you get the encrypted private key. Now, I hope every one of you knows what XOR is. XOR is just a simple operation. I, sorry, I can't explain it to you if you don't know, but um, the only thing you need to know about XOR at the moment is also that it works the other way around. So instead of doing private key XOR keystream and get the encrypted private key, you can also do it the other way around and take the encrypted private key, XOR it with the keystream, and then get the decrypted private key. Now, the question is, what is this keystream, right? That's the only thing we don't know for now. So let's look at what um, what the Java developers uh, decided to design. So the key stream generation is pretty simple again. They invented the new password-based encryption scheme using SHA-1. Now you will say, well, SHA-1, this is so old. Well, Java is old. So if, if you were talking about the primitives, we have to keep in mind that um, this was invented a long time ago, so using SHA-1 was probably a reasonable choice back then. The problem is more that it, it is still the default nowadays. So why did we keep it this long? So they do a password-based encryption, and the generation of the keystream is very simple again. So we have the SHA-1. Uh, it's, a, it's a hash 
algorithm and we take the password, so the private key password, and we concatenate the IV. Now the IV, it's just another parameter stored in the file in plain text. So we can take, we can read out this IV and then generate this first block A. Now the next block is just generated by using the private key password plus A. So we just calculate in the last block and so on and so on with all the uh, blocks. And in the end, we concatenate these blocks together. So we get a key stream of variable length. If that was too quick for you, this is the exact same thing in just a little bit a different picture. So we have a key entry at the top, which has an IV, 20 bytes, we can read it out. Uh, we have a variable length encrypted key at, at the top as well. And we can generate the key stream. We take the password plus the IV from the, the key entry at the top, and we generate the first block. We can then use the first block to generate the second one and so on, and we can XOR them together to get the cryptic key. Now, I tell you that there is a not so obvious weakness here. Can somebody see it? So I didn't see it either when I looked at it, but it's actually something you learn probably in your IT security classes at university. I mean, I learned it at least. So I, I searched around a little bit on the internet what people say about this, um, about this mechanism. And actually there's a website called CryptoSense and they wrote only one SHA-1 application is required to derive the first key stream byte. Since their encoded keys contain a lot of structure in their first bytes, make, it makes a dictionary-based cracker highly efficient. So what they're saying is that we only need to do one SHA-1, not the entire block to, in, to generate the entire key stream. So I thought, wow, this is super cool, but where's the proof of concept? So where is this implemented? And is that even feasible in practice? So I, I researched and researched, but none of the password crackers out there were doing this. And I didn't know back then if this was feasible. So I tried to do a proof of concept just to show that I can crack uh, JKS files easily. And basically our approach or our algorithm to crack passwords is that we generate this first block, the very beginning, with the password candidate, so we guess a password, we just guess one, and then uh, we concatenate it with the IOE, um, we generate the SHA-1, and then we can XOR it with the first 20 bytes of the encrypted key. That should give us the first 20 bytes of the decrypted key. And then we can check these first 20 bytes if they look like a private key. Now, what does it mean, look like a private key? That's actually, again, not a very simple question because these guys of CryptoSense say, well, it's pretty obvious that you can do this. But for me, it wasn't obvious. So the first 20 bytes of a decrypted private key, it's a PKCS8, which is a DUR encoding, which is ASN1. So these are different encodings or standards for how this data is uh, represented. And in theory, it's actually pretty simple. There should be an OID, which is nine bytes long, somewhere at the start. Now, an OID, for example, if we have an RSA key that is stored, then there should be this hexadecimal value somewhere at the start. So what we can do is we search for this OID. So when we get the first 20 bytes, which uh, we hopefully successfully decrypted, then we can search for this OID. And if we find it, we can say, okay, I think I guessed the right password. This could be really, um, what we're doing here is really uh, decrypting a private key. Now, in practice, this is not a very nice idea because searching for the OID is super inefficient. And as I'm not a math student and I'm not a file format specialist, I did the usual IT approach and I just brute forced it. So I generated thousands and thousands of private keys and just looked at them. What a, a private key in plain text, 
how does it look like, the first 20 bytes? And at one point, I realized there is a pattern. So I found out that 16 out of 20 bytes at the beginning of a clear text private key are always static. So they always the same. So for example, RSA, all RSA keys in, in clear text always start with hex 30. Then we have four bytes we don't really know and always vary and are different. But then we have another 16 bytes um, that are always the same. At the end, we can also see this U, uh, OID we saw before, but now we even get more values that are fixed and don't change. So for this not so obvious weakness, let's do an example. So for those who haven't understood yet what we're doing exactly. So what, what we do is we guess a password, we calculate this SHA-1, we XOR it with the first 20 bytes of the encrypted key, get the first 20 bytes of the decrypted key, and then just check if it looks something like this. So this is our cracking algorithm to crack private keys entries. Now, there is, again, an optimization here, and it's the same I told you before about XOR. We can XOR number one with, XOR, with two, and then get the decrypted keys, and then check number three, or we can XOR number three with the um, encrypted key bytes, and we get something we can compare directly to the SHA-1 calculation. So in the end, we end up with one SHA-1 calculation, and then just check if these 20 bytes correspond roughly to the uh, pre-calculated 16 bytes. I then went on and asked some guys to do password cracking. Um, how should we do this? And we decided to implement it in GPUs, so graphic cards, um, which are much faster at calculating SHA-1 uh, sums. And Jens Stäuble from the Hashcat team actually did the implementation, so thank you for that. And the interesting thing is Hashcat is optimized and uses a weakness in SHA-1. You can read about it here. I didn't understand the paper, but I'm happy that it's faster than most other crackers. So um, we're super fast at cracking JKS files. So this is, again, this third design decision, I would say that probably wasn't really um, meant to be like this. And this is the third mistake that was in that code. Now, for those of you for, uh, who think this was too much math or crypto, um, there's also um, a more practical approach. So basically, you can just download my JKS Prif key prepare jar file, then use this JKS file, generate the hash file, and then feed that to Hashcat. So if you're doing a pen test or something and you find a JKS file, you can start to crack it. And it actually surprised me how fast we can do this. So during this run, we have one uh, NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1080 that is on this system, and we're cracking with that one. Um, the type is clear, JKS, and we're doing this with roughly 8,000 million hashes per second, which means we're roughly cracking 8 billion, or we're trying 8 billion passwords per second on this one graphics card. And this is actually super fast. So with one graphics card, we can try all alphanumeric passwords of length eight in eight hours. So this is super efficient cracking. Uh, if you want to get more details about the implementation and uh, well, the benchmarking and how fast it is and so on. I wrote a POC or TTFO article about it. It's in number 15. And I think um, if you read that, you will get some more ideas of uh, how the cracker works. So my recommendations are very generic. Nowadays, we have better key derivation functions. So in the 90s or even in the 80s, I don't know exactly when it was designed, um, there was nothing like a PBKDF2 or Bcrypt or Scrypt or anything for key de derivation. So we have these now. Um, and you should obviously refactor your Java software. So if you use JKS, then it's the time to change your code. So 
I know this is a re really blunt recommendation. Just don't use JKS. But um, although good password will keep you secret, I mean, even a password cracker cannot do anything about passwords of length 12 and above at the moment. And obviously, you should also not publish your JKS files, so keep them secret, even if they're password protected. And the prediction is that JKS will stay for a long time. So this is not something I said, but um, the Java maintainer said existing key stores will not change. So if you wrote the Java software with Java 8 and you generated uh, key stores, then they're JKS. And if you update Java now, it will not change. Nothing will ever change with these key store files until you delete them and regenerate them. So, and key stores tend to be long lived. So you can imagine, I mean, a web server that has keys in it will at least run, um, with, with those JKS files, uh, JKS files until the, um, keys expire. So the alternatives inside of Java, if somebody's a, a Java developer, just don't use JKS. That's the rule of thumb. You can use anything really. Just don't use this default type. Um, probably the, the, the wet dream of all cryptographers is the new BCFKS, it's called. It uses everything which is standard nowadays and uh, you would like to use. So PBKDF2, more than 50,000 rounds of HMAC SHA-512 and it uses the AES CCM mode. So that's, that's probably, uh, really good for, uh, standards nowadays. But Bouncy Castle is an external library. So you will need Bouncy Castle to do this. If you cannot use an, an external library, you can use the PKCS 12, which is using 1000 rounds of SHA-1. So one round of SHA-1 versus 1000 rounds of SHA-1, which is a lot better. Although it's still SHA-1 and thrift triple this. So, and then also as we, as I told this, or, or I talked to, to Oracle, um, they changed Java. So they, they made updates and in these updated Java versions, now the PKCS 12 is 50,000 rounds. Although this part was not my research. So CryptoSense did a lot of research, um, in other areas as well. For example, in the PKCS 12 area and they changed uh, and they basically said, well, 1000 rounds is still not enough. So you should use more rounds. It's also the default key store type since Java nine. So, uh, PKCS 12 is, is now the new type. So when you, ha when you write anything now in Java nine or 10, then you should be much better off. So thank you for attention. This is the first round of questions, I would say. Um, and we'll see after that. So this is the basics about JKS and I would like to get any questions in if there are questions so far. Uh, thank you for your talk. <clears throat> oh, very interesting. Uh, can you tell more a bit about how the integrity is checked? Yes, I will do that later. <laughs> any other questions about Um, I wanted to know how the IV is generated. For Sorry, the IV? It's yes. just randomly generated, 20 okay. bytes random. But I think you're pretty solid on the topic, right? So that's why, because usually I know the Swiss audience doesn't have too many questions, so I prepared a couple of questions for you. <laughs> um, so... We have, we have a question there. Sorry, yeah, sure. Um, the other question was actually about your, your screenshot on, um, Android Studio. Um, yeah. so when you, um, when you're developing an Android application, well, I'm not a very good developer myself, so I'm not sure. Uh, can you specify another, um, another key store than JKS for Android applications? I think it only comes with JKS. Yeah. So, so okay. far you, you so could you're only. Stuck. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For Android okay. Studio, you were stuck. You can probably, you, you might work around it by signing it all in on the command line. You can do that. Yeah, or but you, then you keep it, your nobody's doing secure, that. Yeah, but that's yeah, all. Yeah, Thanks. that's it. Yeah. 
So, so I prepared some questions for you. Um, so, how do you know which fingerprint to expect? So, as we saw, there are different fingerprints. These 20 bytes, how a, a private key starts, it's different for RSA and DSA and so on. So, how do we know which one, which one to expect when we crack? Anybody an idea? Yeah, so I'll repeat it so everybody can understand that. So he said, well, but the public key is not encrypted. So that's actually one thing that helped this research because they didn't encrypt the public key. I can just check what algorithm is used in the public key and then I know which private key fingerprint I have to expect. Otherwise, this will be a lot more guesswork and, and the effort to crack will probably be a lot higher. So we can just check in, in the public key, um, which is not encrypted. So this was a re really easy question to start. Um, here comes the second one. So we only know 16 out of 20 bytes of a fingerprint, right? So when we do cracking, the question marks are unknown. So how do we know we didn't guess the wrong password? So he said uh, we can just test it. We can decrypt the entire private key and then check if that's fine. Uh, yes, that would be an option, but um, that wouldn't perform very well, did it, would it? Because we had to, we we would need to generate the entire key stream first and then XOR. Yeah, I think that probabilities are on your side, right? Yeah, exactly. So. Although there are many question marks, um, the probability is not 100% that we that the password matches. And actually, earlier implementations where I did, I didn't realize that 16 out of 20 bytes were fixed, but less. And we had to check the entire key dec decrypt properly, what, um, um, what you said. But then um, at one point, we realized that actually the probability is one to two to the power of 120, so this will never happen in practice. You will never guess such a password. So we just didn't implement anything afterwards. So this just works like it is. So question three starts with a new fact. And this is actually why this research took me so long. So. If we don't specify a private key password, then the key store password is reused. So we saw for Android that it's just asking for both passwords, but most other tools, so for example, the key tool of Java on the command line, it will only ask for one, and then we'll just set both passwords with the same value. So if we have this default case, can we attack the key store password? And if not, why not? And if yes, why don't we? So any opinions if, if we could crack the other password if they're the same? So if the, the two passwords here are the same, key password and key store password, and this integrity check, and both passwords are the same, well, yes. If the default case applies, the same passwords, we can crack any of these two algorithms. So um, basically it means we could crack with any of the algorithms. So we can crack the integrity protection or we can crack what I just presented. So the question is more like, in the default case, which one performs better? Well. Now, here comes the questions you had before. Can you say something about the integrity check? This is how the integrity check works. So the key store password is actually used at the top. So the key store password, then you concatenate it to the string mighty Aphrodite. <laughs> and then you also concatenate the entire key file. So everything, all the keys. So you have kilobytes of keys and produce one SHA-1 and then you check it against the checksum which is stored in the key store file. So this is 
how it works, mighty Aphrodite. Now, you might ask, why mighty Aphrodite? Well, Aphrodite is the lady on the left. Um, we, yeah, but uh, it's more likely that the Java developers were watching too many movies and uh, there was a movie called Mighty Aphrodite, so that's probably why they choose this random string. So, why not crack the key store password? Anyone a guess? Sorry, can you repeat? It's longer computation, yeah. Yeah, you, you don't have the pattern, but here we would just need to, we have to check some, right? So we could also just crack on this. So the question is really which cracking approach has the better performance and more data go into the SHA-1 calculation when you do the checksum thing, whereas the private key password calculation only has password and IV. So that SHA-1 is much quicker than the other one. And, and what's especially important is you don't know as an attacker if it's the default case. You don't know if the passwords are the same or not. Um, so the private key password approach I showed also works in the non-default case. And the worst thing actually was that most other password crackers, they implemented this key store password cracker. So you could end up cracking and cracking and cracking passwords for days and months and years. And once you found the password, it was super useless because you cracked the key store password, which is only used for integrity protection. And in the non-default case, it's not the same as the key store password. Uh, sorry, private key password. So basically, you could crack and they might not, the, these password crackers might not do anything useful. So, and here's again a simple one to round it off. Do I have time? Yeah. So, what was the best alternative to JKS again? Yeah, PKCS12, that's the default one. So any, really, just don't use JKS. <laughs> um, BC, BCFKS, I hate these names. Anyway, that's the best one. And uh, if you cannot use an external library, use PKCS12, which is um, fixed now. I mean, use more rounds if you have the updates. So if you generate keys after the update, but if you generate them before, then they only have 1,000 rounds. So just get everything um, newly generated. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any more questions. Thank you.